Aaron Phillips. So he called me. Oh, Ken, they out there now. I'm gonna send you the video. They out there now. Now he said he called me, and I'm like, man. So he he, he sent me the video, and I'm looking at it. But I know Cleveland. The store owner didn't get on the phone and say, hey. Party over here at my gas station. These guys just drove up, probably needed gas. They, they ain't just come up there neither. They doing, and, they, and when they pulled up, they, it's a lot of them. And that's how they roll. And when they get up, they make noise. Their music is loud. The store owner in there being like, man, please get your gas and get up out of here as soon as you can. And, and it's just what happens in the city of Cleveland. And I think and, 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 it's just what happens. And Kenny, I think that would happen if the gas station was closed. It would still yeah. be there. Except... They were probably breaking <laughs> and go looting the place. If, if that's, that's those guys. Yeah. And again, this is why I'm trying to get Phillips to understand. Everybody that pulls up to the gas station with loud music and a couple of their guys with cars isn't up to bad. No, they could be just pulling up because we having a good time tonight. My car's looking good. I got my boys. We feeling good tonight. Oh, we need some gas. We come. Oh, it sounds even better in here because it's echoing up off of Sam's big old canopy he got up there. They getting their gas. The girls in there get, they just come with a lot of racket. And from riding by looking over there, you probably, oh no, I'm not going over there. Those right. guys probably get what they want to get and get going. The problem that they're selling them having is those guys when those guys leave it's three or four other guys that are still standing there standing, yeah. those guys and those they, are the problem guys and they know the laws on their side no yes. one's going to move them. and nobody's going to move challenge them. you to move yeah. them. you see those guys and you like look at these trucks and no. stuff the trucks no, and all no, that. I, I will tell you this i'll change i'll move them I'll tell you what. I, how about I'll tell you what. Let's take a date, and, I'll, and you can bring three or four people, and I can tell you where it happens. I want to see how you're going to confront the situation. No, I'm wondering. Yeah, I would like to do that. And okay. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> yeah, we going to do it now. Listen, I just, I, 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 hey, y'all hey, viewers, y'all heard him say yeah, that. We're going to take the camera, and we're going to let Phyllis. He I, said he going to approach him. Okay. We're going to let him. I, I want to witness that. <laughs> so you can <laughs> you <could> witness <laughs> that on a daily okay, basis anyway. Okay. This is Strategic Moves with Ken Dow. What's up, everybody? You tuned in to another episode of Strategic Moves. I'm your host, Ken Dow. This is a place where we bring art, culture, politics, and business all together, and we do it every Sunday right here on this channel. But when I'm not shooting this podcast, I am the owner of Strategic Resources, where, where we specialize in political campaigns, government, and public relations. I've been doing it for over 25 years all over the state of Ohio and met some interesting people along the way. And this program gives me an opportunity to bring them in and we talk about some of the things we learned and some of the things that might be able to help you along the way. So, if this sounds like something you're interested in, what I need you to do is hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell as well so that you will know the next time this program is on the air. So today, on this program, I got a few of my homies in today and we're going to talk about the culture. We're going to talk, give it up for the culture today. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the streets of Cleveland. We're going to talk from a business perspective. We have one of our leading gentlemen. He's been a friend of mine for almost three decades now. He was around before my daughter was born because he came to my house and bought me a gift for my daughter when she was born. So he's been around for a while. Uh, his name is Samir Muhammad. He's in on our program, and I also got another gentleman here today who's not a stranger to our program. He's been on here a few times, and he's none other than Pastor Aaron Phillips. So, everybody, let's give it up for our guest here today, y'all. Right. So, Pastor, before we get going, before I get going, I want to give a first shout-out. Let's give a shout-out to the best producer in Cleveland who helped produce these podcasts, Latif, DJ True. How you doing in there today? Good, I'm good, I'm good. So we talking about the culture today, huh? It's all about the culture today. We're going to sit back and talk we to these outside, guys. outside, huh? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We're going to talk about what's going on in Cleveland. There's a lot of myth, and people are always talking about everything about various different cultures and some of the things they do and why we don't understand. We're going to talk a little bit about that today, and we're going to talk about business. And so let's get going. We're going to get right to it I because like it, these I guys like are all busy. And if you got any questions, Latif, just jump right on in. All right, so let's get going. We're going to start off here with Sam. You are a new guest, and you first on our show. Man, Thank I want to first introduce Samir. He's been around for a while. As I told everybody, he's a businessman in this community. He's an entrepreneur. He owns several businesses. He's been doing things in our community. He's been in government. He's been working on political campaigns with me. He's been doing statistics. So in 
all fashion of how we do in most of our programs here, I want to go ahead, Sam, and just ask you a quick question. You know, where you grew up here in Cleveland. How long have you been here in this country? Give us your little background. Give us the the, uh, the stump speech. Uh, basically, I'm a, a almost a lifelong resident of the city of Cleveland. I came here when I was four years old when I immigrated. Mm -hmm. My parents immigrated from the Middle East okay. and the West Bank uh, of Jordan. Mm -hmm. so you was four years old when you came here. How many brothers and sisters you? I have two brothers and uh, two sisters. Two brothers and two sisters, and you came here when you was four. How you the youngest, oldest? I'm the second oldest. My I have a sister that's older than me. Oh, so you the second oldest. Yeah, second. Oh, okay. And your two brothers, they work. They here. Yeah, right? correct. And your sister lives in Dubai, right? Yes, I have a sister yeah. in Dubai. One that's here, and. Mm -hmm. uh, both brothers are in this area. So you went to school here. So what, did you go to public schools or where did you go? Yes, I went to public schools and I moved out of Cleveland right around the time of busing mm -hmm. and went out to Lake County. So what elementary you went to? I went to, I started at Hicks Elementary, then Scranton Elementary. Oh, you went to Hicks and Scranton yeah. and then right before middle school. Yeah, they I, sent went, you. I went to Lincoln Jr. Uh huh. And then. Then after Lincoln Jr., you went ahead and. The busing was about to kick in. It actually kicked it, in. It kicked in. And you told me, you said they was going to send you to Empire. Correct. Yeah, if you would have came to Empire, Pastor, he'd have been there right with me. Because <laughs> we were in, we was in the same age yeah. and we was in the same class. And I was at Empire yeah. during that time. Yeah. So you got bust right in the nick of time. Because there was a lot of crazy boys back there in Empire. So maybe not. Who knows how things would turn out. So after that, you went on to college here? Or what did went you do? College, Cleveland State University. Mm -hmm. Bachelor, Master's. Then I got my JD at a later time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you got your master's in uh, public administration. I didn't know you had a lot of practice law, but I have. Yeah, my, I have. that's why when you said it threw me for a loop. I said you got your master. I didn't know you had your JD. Really? Yeah, I, mean, you just, nah, I don't call them doctors. <laughs> <laughs> doctors. <laughs> <soon. laughs> you call every attorney a doctor. I don't think they call them that. Mm -hmm. You can't, uh, yeah. but it is a juris doctor. It is. That's what it's called. JD is juris doctor. Yeah, yeah that's what it is. That's, that's what it is. All right. I didn't know that all these years, man. I knew you had a master's degree. I didn't know you had a JD too. Oh, okay. So why you didn't ever use it? Why you didn't want to do I was that? I always in government. Never even needed to use it. It would be a conflict and things like that. But you never, you just all just wanted to do government? Just for knowledge. I was mm -hmm. a, it was a joint degree when I got mm -hmm. So when you was growing up, you was, me and you talked about this. We just go a little bit into this discussion. When you was growing up, you say your father and your parents migrated here. You say your parents, your father came here first, right? Correct. My mom and dad. Mm -hmm. and, and then they had to send for you. So you said back in those days, your parents came here. They lived at, um, with other people and uh, other families. Yes. And, and so give us a little background on how that whole thing goes, because a lot of people just don't understand yeah. that. After the war in the Middle East, especially in the Palestinian, and after 1967, after the war of 67 with, with Israel, mm -hmm. a lot of the Palestinians were misplaced. A lot of them were to different countries and they're refugees. Mm -hmm. My dad immigrated to the U.S. because his family was here. My mom's family was here. Both my parents came here. Then at a later time, after he set, got himself a job, an apartment, and things like that, my mom came back and brought me and my sister over. And what was your father's first job, you say? When he my, got my dad's first job, actually, he worked at Alpo Dog Food Factory on Denison Avenue. Man, how long he worked there? He worked there for, I believe, four or five years. Then it moved out, out of the state. So he was left uh, without a job. So he became an entrepreneur. So when you say that and you say he was left without a job, we understand he lost his job and he became an entrepreneur. What was his first business he did? What did a grocery store? Really? What was your first grocery store? You remember? West Fifty Fourth in Detroit, Palestine Delicatessen. Really? You had a wow. delicatessen. Yes. Yeah. So it was your father, your mom, who worked in that business? I worked there when I was eight years old. I was working there. Really? <laughs> wow. And what was y'all selling at a delicatessen? Just a regular corner grocery store. It was just oh, it was a delicatessen, but it was a corner grocery yeah, store. Corner grocery store. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was just a store. I remember one of the challenges I remember you was telling me growing up was that the language barrier between that and you having to help your parents understand business at an early age because there were inspectors and people who were coming in. Everybody wasn't always cool. No. Not only that, when I was in school, they put me in a bilingual class. In the bilingual class, I was they put me in a Hispanic class. So I, I didn't understand Hispanic. <laughs> so that was the only bilingual program that they had. So they put wow. me in that bilingual program with Hispanics. Really? Yeah. Wow. So that even made it more difficult for me. Wow. And so how was it doing business with your father growing up back then? I know yeah. then you was telling the lottery and everything else was going on. Actually, it was much simpler back then. It was, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, much simpler. It, it, it's gotten much more complex. Mm -hmm. Crime rates have gone up. The people in the neighborhood, you knew, everyone knew everyone in the neighborhood. Now it's the, you could own a corner store and you don't know who your neighbors are. They keep moving. 
Yeah, that's true. You know who Ms. Jones is, Ms. Smith, and everyone mm-hmm. else. It's like on a... You'd, and sometimes you'd have a tap for them at the end of the month. They'd come and straight and they, would, they would be down, couldn't make it to the beginning of the month. And that's how the corner stores operated back then. A lot of corner stores operated back then. Because yeah. when I was a kid, I, I remember exactly what you were talking about. And there was a lot of businesses and stores that operated along those lines. Yeah. So let's move along a little bit. What got you into the entrepreneurial side of saying, you know what, I want to start getting into my own business? My dad was there. It's always... It's all you want to control your own destiny. And my dad, when mm-hmm. he became an entrepreneur, it's not because he wanted to. It's because mm-hmm. there was discrimination of the unions against Middle Easterners. It was hard to get into these factories mm-hmm. and break in. Like the Palestinian community in Detroit mm-hmm. had the ends with Ford, Chrysler, and all of them. Most of them didn't take the entrepreneurship. A lot of them were re- now they're retired from mm-hmm. the General Motors or Chrysler or the big car factories. In the Cleveland area, it was very difficult to get in the steel mills mm-hmm. and the other manufacturers. A lot of the Middle Easterners here that came from where my dad came from had to make their own jobs, which was they had to become entrepreneurs because mm-hmm. they weren't they couldn't break into the union ranks mm-hmm. and get in and work. So the, how was they able to get become entrepreneurs? Because here goes another Ur, um, urban legend and, and we're going to debunk today. Everybody yeah. feels as if they come over here. You guys come over here with a bag of money. You come over with the ability to not have to pay taxes because the government don't let y'all pay taxes when y'all move in. So y'all come in. And here's another one I think we heard also that they give you actual money to help you buy these businesses. So uh, $10, how $10,000? How did you, when, how did you, when did your dad get all some, of that? Someone <laughs> forgot to give my dad that because he didn't have enough to bring me and my sister over here. <laughs> so that's a total uh, misconception. So how long does it before he was able to get y'all over here? It took him about a year and a half so he can get enough to get our airline tickets to come here. And that was just to get the airline just tickets. Just to get the tickets, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So tell me about how did he was able, you come over here and you come over here, a lot of Arab business, owner, Indian business, just people in general. We yeah. ain't gonna just single out people, come over here. How do they actually get the opportunity to come over here and make the actual m- money that do? How did he save up to buy that business that we're talking about? Well, he started small, you're talking about a small grocery store that mm-hmm. they don't exist anymore. They've been, they're extinct now. Okay. Those small mom and pop stores. It didn't cost much to do that. It's just mm-hmm. the inventory and the rent was very cheap. It's just. Mm-hmm. You had to work 16 hours, Mm -hmm. 16 to 18 hours a day. That's the, how many people are willing to work 16 to 18 hours a day Mm -hmm. every day? But how did he get his seed money? He came over broke. Basically, he he, uh, he saved whatever he could, borrowed from different family members. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how most of the immigrants, there was no money coming in. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have left their country if they had money. Mm-hmm. Or torn, they came with maybe they're lucky to have you know twenty dollars or a hundred dollars with them when they came over, mm-hmm. and you're not eligible for any programs when you come to become a citizen. You're not eligible for welfare or any loans or anything like that. So let's go into that. So you say when you come over here as a foreigner, you're not eligible for welfare. No, not only that. If you go to college or school, you pay double the tuition. Double the tuition. That's correct. You're not a resident, and that's still true as of today. If someone came over that's not a, a citizen. Mm -hmm. or is not a resident, they're going to pay, whether it's Cleveland State, Ohio State, or whatever, they're going to pay double the tuition. So most of the foreign students that's over here now, they're paying double the tuition. Correct. And they can't get student loans for them. That's correct. They're not eligible. And they really can't work. No. (laughs) So how do they go to school? They go to just the school. Basically, school pay double. And their parents just sending money over. Or uh, or family help. Other people help them. Really? So you get... When I was in college, I had friends that they would live five or six in an apartment to make it. Wow. Interesting. So let's move on a little bit to uh, times went on. You got out of that and you worked in government for a little while. And now you decide that you want to start getting into business. What was your first business you got into? Uh, my first business actually came through government. I met a friend. He was in the gas station business and he offered me to take over one of his gas stations. And that was your very first one you took first. over? That's correct. I was in college. I was still in college getting my master's degree when I went in there, yes. Hmm. And how long did you own that one? I owned it for maybe seven or eight years, that particular one. And then you sold it or? Then yes, I sold it, but at that time I had others mm-hmm. when I sold it. And so how many did you end up acquiring? At one time I had- Over 28? Yeah. 
Yeah. And how is it in the gas station business? And most people who like to say we see these gas stations in the community and people swear that they're making a lot of money and that kind of thing. Uh, let's talk about the gas station business, how it was and how it's changed since we done started doing business lately. When you first got going, what was the difference in the community as well as the type of business that was going through there? When I first got in, it was competition was, oh, there wasn't fierce competition. Mm -hmm. There were big margins. So you're margining on the, you were actually making money off the gas. Mm -hmm. You're making 30, 40 cents. Nowadays, you're lucky. You're lucky to break even. If you're margining at 10 cents these days, now credit cards predominates 80 to 90% of your business. When I was there, you rarely seen credit cards. It was 80, 90% cash. So you didn't have these fees to pay. Now it's, mm -hmm. you're paying 2.4% of every dollar is going towards a fee. So when you're, for example, if you're talking $3 a gallon of gas and there's 2.4 cents a fee, mm -hmm. you're, you're at 8 cents, 8 point something, going just for a credit card fee. So if you're margining at 10 cents, you're making, you're lucky to make 2 cents or 3 cents on a gallon. Hmm. Sam, how did you get started in your business, your first business that you went to? that you acquired from your family. Was that a family member? No, not so a family. How did, how did you it, it was through, a, actually, it was the, the right, I was at the right place at the right time, and, and it, I, it was through a friend who were, we, we were running a political campaign together at the time, and later we met up. He was down on his luck and asked me if I can step in he was African-American. Hey, this is my show. It was Because this is what we hear on this program to really talk about. He was African-American. He owned some gas stations in the city of Cleveland on the east side and maybe a few on the west. I don't know. But mainly on the east side. He got into some situations and he had to liquidate. And he came to Sam because him and Sam had knew each other, as he said. And that's basically how it went. And that's how he bought his first one. Yeah, and that's you how I... You raise the capital yourself? No, oh, tell him about that deal. That was I'd say it was a handshake deal. <laughs> it's I paid as I went along. Yeah, there was some capital. And then and, and he helped finance it. And he did it on a handshake. Yeah, on a handshake deal. You have to go to the bank. The bank won't give you any money anyway for gas stations. So you're in the inner city. You could forget that the, this is the problem with gas stations. Banks do not finance, especially in the inner city. Okay, then you've got the environmental issues and things like that, which even complicates them further. So it's very difficult to get a bank to finance a gas station these days. I was telling Kim, uh, I grew up with gas stations. My uncle mm -hmm. owned gas stations on Texaco's. Yes. So I went to Texaco school, all that. Yeah. So, so I know all about that, and you're absolutely right about that. My uncle got a gas station very similar to the way mm -hmm. he did. My dad actually owned it and mm -hmm. sold it to, to him. Yeah. So it's a family kind of a deal. And I, I know one thing that, is always said in the black community is that the Arab store owners, they get ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. They can open up a gas station. All they're going to open it up in our neighborhood. And the, the, the plan is to make sure they have those stores in our neighborhood to sell all the wrong stuff, make us get high blood pressure and diabetes and jack up the prices. And the government's all a conspiracy. So I think that it's important for us to debunk that, that conspiracy theory that this doesn't even exist. And I think one of the things that I always would self tell people, if an Arab store owner can do it, that means if you're black, you can do it. It's not, it's not and, something and, that and, is... And the African-American uh, African uh, of us gas station owners were in it in the inner city. Mm -hmm. A lot of them that I purchased from, their kids didn't want to take it on. They didn't want to put the 16 to 18 hours. And mm -hmm. it's not as easy as you think. So no, you it's have, not easy. It's, it's, it's very yeah. difficult, very stressful. Mm -hmm. And it's not all the profit and good that's there. Mm -hmm. So they ended up leaving their retirement. There was no succession. They couldn't. Their kids wanted no part of it. Their family wanted no part of it. Well, they didn't want the stress. <clears throat> that happened. That happened with me and my uncle. And he actually, he's one of my. He was my favorite. He yeah. passed. He's my favorite uncle. And uh, what is true? And they went. They took us to Texaco school and all that. My cousin, my because I have a cousin from my yeah. brother. When we did we went over that process, we decided then we didn't want no parts of that. <laughs> I didn't know exactly well, what you're talking about. And to this day, <laughs> we don't own. We're not in that business. And this, and my uncle and my aunt since passed, but they were not there. They, uh, my, my cousins didn't go in that business, but it was all set up for them. But nobody, because it is a hard grind. That's hard, hard grind. Hard grind. This is where we went to school. We went to, yeah. I got to go to college. Yeah. I all got to go to law school, all that because of the, because we had those resources, but we didn't want to go in that business at all. It was a time in our community where the community went through that during that process where 
and at one point, especially in Glenville, we can talk about Glenville. I could talk from that experience where most of that community was owned by the Jewish community, had mm-hmm. owned businesses and things all over there. The synagogues and all of that stuff is all through the neighborhood. Black folks, as they migrated to Cleveland, worked in those communities mm-hmm. for those folks. And as those people migrated out of Cleveland, the Shaker, Cleveland Heights, and other places, the properties and things that were left behind, black folks were able to acquire some of the businesses and things just like what Sam was saying. But it came to a point that I know for a fact, because I was working for Glenville Development Corporation around that time, where people started selling their homes. And the reason why they were selling their homes is because they got older. And the same thing what Sam was saying is that they kids didn't want to buy the house or the kids didn't want the property either. They did send them off to college and they moved to Atlanta or somewhere else and didn't want to come back to Cleveland. So they were selling these properties pretty cheap or their kids were selling them. They out of town and was like, hey, I just want to get rid of the house. They didn't want it. Or they was like, hey, I watched my dad and mom sweat in that dry cleaners all these years. I watched them at that store. I just don't want to do it. And, and as Sam said, I think alone came opportunity for folks who didn't even have that to say, hey, I want to jump in and start to buy those type of business. And I think that's where the influx of business owners and and things in our community came from, I think is a a big example of how that happened. So Sam, let's talk about, I know one of the things, one of the gas stations you own, I remember when you first bought that one over on 140th in St. Clair, he used to call me and be like, the girl whoever didn't work third shift didn't come in and he used to have to go down there and work at night and call me to come down there with him while he's down there working man and i'm telling you it was crazy down there back then and that was 10 years ago and one of the laws that sam has been a real thing about and we can get into this discussion with the arab business owners and we're getting not and we call them arab business we're gonna say the business owners because this is i was just on a hundred of fan um buckeye and is the business owner and is a dollar store on another corner is a Popeye's chicken over on another corner. That whole corner, that whole area is just is being infused with just a lot of violence and maddening craziness that's going on there. One of the things Sam was complaining back then was the nuisance laws and the fact that Cleveland, when you call the police, they just don't do anything. And now we have uh, the city of Cleveland now wants to pass a law that is going to start to that they want to have business owners, I believe, bring in security. What is it from seven o'clock to midnight or something like that? They're trying to do now that um, on that and the complaint that most of the business owners in the inner city is saying is the fact that they never got any support from the police. So you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, it's not so much so uh, support from the police. It's it's the policies that were in place. There's tax dollars. We're paying heavy tax dollars to the, uh, the community. Mm-hmm. There has to be a burden from the city to provide at least the basic services of mm-hmm. safety. And that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. And we're talking late 99 when I called you in. Mm-hmm. The, the panhandling started. Mm-hmm. I told you this was going to spin out of control. Something small is going to get into something big. Here we are 25 years later, mm-hmm. and it's way out of control. Mm-hmm. You can go now and, and go down the freeway exits as you exit. Nowhere but in the city of Cleveland do you have a panhandler on every exit. Mm-hmm. And nothing's being done about it. I mean, that, what kind of signal does that send? to your city. You can go every other outlying city and th- th- that doesn't exist. The minute you get into an exit ramp off the city of Cleveland, there's someone there who's holding a sign, homeless, and, and they've been there for five, six, seven years. I've mm-hmm. stopped and I've given them cards, say, here's a job paying $15 an hour. Go there, they can put a... But those are the guys who are not. They've made it into a business. But that's not what's hurting us in the city. But that's going to spin out of control if, at every gas station at every corner you have these panhandlers whether they're selling drugs or trying to carjack you or something if you can't move them mm-hmm. it's causing an issue and they know the police aren't going to do nothing you as an owner are putting your life at if you're confronting them and you shouldn't have to confront them mm-hmm. the, the, the police should come and remove them so what's and the- you know who they are they're the same people all the time the na- mm-hmm. the neighborhood knows who they are it's not like they're strangers coming in so you get a law for mandating that 24 hour businesses have a security let me tell you that that one one is the city of cleveland can't hire enough police how do you expect the businesses to now let me give you the problem with the business when it comes to budget 
if, if you had a typical, and I'm going to go over the average gas station, let's say you have three employees making $20 an hour, that's $60. Imagine doubling your payroll overnight. What would that do to any institution, any government, any business? That would basically bankrupt you. And, and the, you, the, if the city of Cleveland can't find police, they expect the small businesses to find them? Listen, I, I just want to get that out there. I think that's important. Yeah, I, I think I they're don't... passing the buck. I hate to say it, but that's, I think there's, there's got to be a burden from the city to provide its services. There's plenty of tax dollars. Well, I, was, I, I thought you were going to say, because if I was, if I, I have a church. Mm -hmm. So if the city told me I had to have a security person, for the, uh, a security person for my church, which we do, mm -hmm. but if the city told me, that I had to have one, then I would expect the city to put some money behind that. Because if you're giving me an unfunded mandate, Correct. that's ridiculous. You can't tell me to do something and don't fund me to help me do it, and, and, and otherwise I'm breaking the law. Yeah. No, that's that doesn't work like that. So I think that you can't have a, I just, I'm against unfunded mandates, period, no matter what they are. And, and, and if you have the, you have various politicians trying to pass the buck as this is a solution, let's pass this issue on to somebody else. Now, actually it sits at, it, it rests at, right at their plate. Listen, I know I sound like a quote-unquote Republican, but it really doesn't make sense for the government to tell me to do something and then don't give, does not give me the resources to do that particular thing. And we have a lot of that going on. And I think that any, in, this isn't, shouldn't be a small business owner's issue. I think the businesses across uh, the city of Cleveland should maybe say, hey, if they will do that to small business corner store owners, so but but shouldn't the owners of these businesses should have some damn protection? Shouldn't you feel protected when you come into a business? And, and, and I don't think the issue is a customer. And I think the business owners have that ability. They protect when you go in, you feel safe and stuff. The problem mm -hmm. is, what even if they hire a security guard, mm -hmm. if you look at some of the crimes that are happening, it's not... It's not their business that's causing. You got someone who's going to carjack someone coming down the street, or you have someone chasing someone who got out of a club and it's a drive-by shooting. What is that guard going to do? Mm -hmm. Those are the kind of crimes that are happening, okay? They're not the types that are coming in there. You're, you're being harassed in the gas station or anything like that. You'd find very little of that happen. Now, there has to be, you're talking about, listen, I'm paying my tax dollars, and I want service for those dollars. If you can't handle it, give me those tax dollars back, and let me then mm -hmm. manage it a little better. Mm -hmm. There's mismanagement of those dollars somehow. The, the, for example, the city of Cleveland took 200 police off its rolls because they can't hire them. Mm -hmm. And it's getting, the problem's going to get worse and worse, especially with this issue 24. Mm -hmm. I know some people are for some. It's, it's allowing the police a reason not to come to the city of Cleveland. Either you're going to have to pay them way more than the suburban mm -hmm. police mm -hmm. or something. So how are the small businesses going to handle the failures of the various uh, political entities? So let me ask you this question. Kenny, here's the other problem. You, you already have the city having a major problem bringing in businesses. Mm -hmm. You keep putting the barrier up, up, and they give them a reason not to come. Mm -hmm. Give them a reason. Already, you, you don't understand what they're putting up with. They're redlined from insurance. The red line. So when you say y'all red line from insurance, what you mean by because that? Because it's high risk and there's so many claims you get canceled. It's hard to even get affordable insurance in some inner city areas. One mm -hmm. lawsuit or something like that, then you, it, you're you almost at the edge. Mm -hmm. So is, is you saying most of the businesses in the, that from most of your experience of buying gas stations and those type of businesses, you're saying the inner city is very hard to find? It's much more expensive to do business in inner city versus any other area. If you were in the suburbs, it, the cost of doing business is a lot less. Yeah. And I imagine because of the theft and everything else, also I imagine your insurance would be a little bit higher as well. Insurance is higher, and then you have, then you on top of that, you have most of the inner city owners having to open twenty four hours because not so much they're making money; it's because their place they want to make sure it's there in the morning. One thing I would like to ask, and, and, I, I, and I'm serious about this because. I feel that way no matter who the business owner is. One of the, maybe it's a myth, maybe it's not, is that it's in the communities that the store owners don't live in the community that their business is in. So therefore, there's not a stake. Yeah. Walmart yeah. Don't, don't live in the no. community. And I will, and I will Home say Depot this, don't uh, either. Uh, well, Amazon I don't. I think, that is, I think that is different. And I How? do, I will, I'll explain that. Dave's also, don't. I also say uh, that about churches. Because there's a lot of pastors, and I'm very consistent with this, there's mm -hmm. a lot of pastors who 
pastor in the city, but don't live in the city. Some of them are dear friends of mine. I, I think that is some value, but I think if you, we, but you don't have to live in the city to be concerned about the city. Yeah. But I think that's something that needs yeah. to be put on the table. L- listen, I'm yeah, one that lived in the city, and I don't think the ones that live outside the city, uh, there is concern. Yes. I don't think that holds any water. Once you have a massive investment, you've got some skin in the game. You're concerned what happens there. It's not, these things aren't cheap to put up, and the profit is not what people think they are. If there's someone else from the community who would like to put one up, tell them to put a gas station up. Put it up. There's nothing stopping anyone from putting a corner store or a business. And you look at it like the market will dictate. If you're having a bad product, people will stop coming to you and you'll end up closing your door. Right. You put a good product out there and people will keep coming and you'll do, you'll do your. That's the free market. Okay, and that's what that's what should dictate who's a good businessman and who's not. I mean, you have a choice. You don't have to come to my gas station or Kenny's gas. You can go anywhere you want. The reason why those stores are there is because the store brings something to the community that the community needs. Now, to Sam's point, if that business is a bad business, if the guys in there are mean or nasty to the community, if the store is nasty, dirty, and it's not doing good, the community has the ability to close that store down in several ways of doing it through protests if that's the route or sam said the easiest way is just stop going there the margins in these stores are so tight that if you was to just stop going there and stop shopping there you can close the stores down let me throw this out there ken if you look at the major brands they Mm -hmm. don't do business in the city anymore because they lose money Mm -hmm. okay and and you look at it, the, the, the big gas stations, the big supermarkets, mm-hmm. the big players don't like doing business in the city of Cleveland. Most of their places have closed. There's a reason for that. Let's and talk about this real quick. Cause we, let, let's know this is what we're going to get to. We're going to yeah. get it to the reason. Cause I, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier and it's his back to when you, it, about the community and knowing the community, when we grew up, it was that where you could run tabs and you had those things where the community took care of the small grocers took care of the needs in between pays and whatnot for the community and that's to your point where the community was working better sam what was it that happened in the city of cleveland that you believe is sparring is what sparked this food deserts and everything we got now in our community it's the lack of safety lack of response by the city on miss the, the it, it's difficult to do business in the city of cleveland you try to go get a permit mm-hmm. it's difficult in other cities they roll out the red carpet no before you get there okay. i'm talking about and prior I, to that what prior, led up to well, why these stores are why we're barren in our community okay. why no more say more it's why no more well, John, eagles what happened? Know, I, 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 we got rid of there's no more black middle class no that, that ain't the reason inside of the city that's but not they, the still shop. And, and they still shop they still I shop with you. they still shop no they, they don't shop in the cl- no we're talking about why they're not in why the inner they're city not, why they're not located in the city those this people still go, go shop but what happens is it became too expensive to do business in the inner city mm-hmm. point blank well you needed more employees mm-hmm. crime is on the rise if you need those security guards those people they took their dollars and went elsewhere it was too big of a risk to do business in the city you can't get insurance your insurance is higher maintenance the cost of doing business in the inner city is considerably more than doing it in the suburbs so what happened they took listen you said the government what did government i don't think made you have the government has to level the field okay knowing Mm -hmm. what it's like to be a business a small business in the city okay Mm -hmm. when for example just let's take the basics when i can't get a shoplifter okay picked up imagine if you're a giant eagle how many shoplifting and there's no one responding even your guards can't get anything. It, it becomes too difficult. Mm-hmm. You're broken into at night. Your windows are busted. Too many slips and falls. Too much. And here's a fact of the inner city. The average sale in the inner city is considerably less than a suburb. Let me give you an idea for a gas station. The, the gas station, on, on if you're in the suburb, the average person who gets to the pump is filling up. It's 50 or $60. Mm-hmm. They're not wearing and tearing that pump as they do. You go to the inner city, the average is maybe six, seven dollars a sale, not fifty. Uh, that's what I was trying to. So the see. station looks busier, mm-hmm. but in actuality, it's not. Right. They, they need twenty cars to show what one yeah. suburban station just had in sale of one. Now imagine how much wear and tear on that pump just to get you to one sale mm-hmm. in the suburb. 
But that's something you have to deal with. Now, on top of that, you add these layers. Okay, I've got these panhandlers I can't get rid of. I've got the shoplifting I can't handle. And what they try to do uh, for safety, there's no gas station that doesn't have minimum 10 cameras to 40 cameras. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Surveillance. But you show it to the, you, you take those, uh, those photos to the police and nothing happens. There's an issue there. How much, what do you want to call? Do you want to call in the National Guard? If you think one, I think so. If you, want to, if you think <laughs> one think guard is going point. to help at any corner, you're mistaken. Well, and, and there's some people that have taken, we don't want you to sell beer. Guess what? There's, state, there's a lot of stations in the, in, the, in the inner city that don't sell. They have the same exact problems with beer and without beer. Mm -hmm. No, it's not the beer or the wine yeah, It's not all. the beer, but there's some council people and there's some other politicians that will say, we don't want you to have a liquor license because this will cause problems. You're, you're disenfranchising the actual community that wants to have to get their product. You're making them go further mm -hmm. to get their product. Let me, I'm going to go back to this food desert because I think you missed my point. Me and Sam talk all the time. I'm trying to lead him into some of these conversations, but he don't understand. So I'm going to exactly go, go right there at it, it. It, it, it. There's no subsidies. They used to give these places, there Giant Eagle last time, they gave them tax abatement. I'm going to tell you what happened. In a, and me and Kenny have talked about this. The Save Moors, the Arab grocers, the middle uh, supermarkets. And what year was that? When, let's talk, we're, let's we're, give we're some, talking, some specific. We're talking 1999, 2001. That's where the CVSs and all of these all of a sudden blew. How many drugstores did we really have on each corner? Maybe seven. And this, all of a sudden, we had a hundred. And then you had a couple of giant eagles being built where they were. Uh, it was it tops or save a lot? Was it tops or finest? Tops finest. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, yeah. You know, when you give them, for example, if, if I'm a small businessman and I'm putting up my dollars, and you as a city give three million in tax abatements to this big guy to come in there. And I don't even have the ability. Uh, it's hard for me to get insurance, and I can't even get storefront renovation. And I can't put in money because the more money I put in, there's no insurance for it to upgrade my facility. And you give someone three million or five million tax abatement to do something. Now mm -hmm. you're making a total disadvantage for that small guy when you give that, okay, for him to compete. So what happened? They put these places up, which knocked all these moderate sized supermarkets out of the city. When they closed down, all of what the, 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 the problems that I told you about caught up to those big guys. Mm -hmm. they, they left. But what did they leave? They closed all the competition, and they left, Nothing. leaving a void. And so I want to stay on this point because this is an important point. Because that was the beginning of the food deserts in our community. The tops, the finest, the eat giant eagles, all of these did exactly what we said over time. The wear and tear of the city caught up with them business wise and they left out. In that process of the city giving these abatements and things to the big boys, it, it squoze the small business jobs, eagles, and all these other supermarkets end up leaving. And so now we're down to nothing. nothing. And, and, and we're going the same way because the point that Sam made was there was no subsidy, there was no storefront renovation money or any of that. So now here we go. Years and years later, we back at the same position again, where now we got gas stations, we got businesses, small storefronts doing the same thing where the city is, again, not giving any subsidies or anything out to try to say, you know what, we got a problem with your gas station over here or this um, with the people that's here or whatever that's going on here with no help and how we're going to fix that. They still can't get um, storefront renovation. They're still not eligible to get any of the things that's necessary to win. So Sam, let's talk about some of the issues that you think now from, since then that from some of the business owners that you deal with, what is some of the biggest problems that we're having with the um, city of Cleveland and these stores? I understand the police, but anything. It's not just the police. It's, it's just how their approach. It's like they are the scapegoats. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to, we have an issue. Guess what? We're going to, in the city of Cleveland, remember there, there was an attempt to, to ban, for example, uh, selling cigarettes in the city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. What does that do? What does that do to the inner city business person who does? That gives him a total disadvantage. Everyone goes to the East Cleveland stores, to the mm -hmm. Lakewood stores, mm -hmm. to all the inner ring suburbs. So it puts them at a bigger disadvantage. Another one is now they're having safety issues. Guess what? Instead of them fixing their issues, they're saying, oh, maybe you need to put guards. That's basically doubling their payroll. That's not helping matters any. It's making matters worse. So you're having people who are making decisions that don't really understand what it takes to be a small businessman. You have to 
And, and, and some, I hate to say it, you put some of these politicians, you give them the most profitable business, and they'll bankrupt it in a year or two, making decisions that they make. Mm -hmm. they, they, you have to understand what that typical uh, small, whether it's a, a barber shop or a gas station or whatever, they, it, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge. And, and that's what I was talking about, Ken. Mm -hmm. I, I say this on a regular basis. There's a, it's not just that the middle class is shrinking across mm -hmm. America, but it's really a shrinking in black America. Like when, say when, White America gets a cold, black mm -hmm. America gets pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, the, the tragedy of the loss of the black middle class in our communities right now. That's, those are the folks who helped us, who helped with the civil rights movement. Those are the folks who have pushed us in the 80s and the 90s. Those are the folks who helped build our churches. And one you see now, one of the reasons our churches are empty in, in the inner city is because we don't live there anymore. Why don't we live there? There's many reasons. Security, education, the, the lack of businesses in our communities. There's, a, there's multiple reasons, a multiple factors have put us in this position. Not one single factor. The only grocery store that's in the inner city is Dave's. Mm -hmm. Dave's supermarket. It's the only grocery store that mm -hmm. is in the inner city right now. Everybody else, Giant Eagle, the new store that's coming to town. We need to have people start moving back into the community, paying tax. We have all these abandoned houses and abandoned properties. I mean, it makes it very difficult to have a holistic life in the city. We had a press conference the other day, and uh, you remember Pastor Ken Chalker, the white pastor. We were, all of, we were talking about the violence and the voting on issue one. The white pastor stood up and said, if the problems of Cleveland was happening in Westlake or in Solon, you would have a riot because they wouldn't stand for it. Correct. But in, in the inner city of Cleveland, why do we stand for it? Because of people who shouldn't be living there don't live there anymore. Yeah, we have been disenfranchised by multiple reasons. And we, if we don't start solving this problem together, it's only going to get worse. And what we can't do, afford to do, and this is what I, I really appreciate about this show, is to have the vision between the Arab community and the black community. That is like the craziest thing in the world because we all need to be working together, not working against each other. One of the biggest things and the reason why I wanted to have it is that there's just all kinds of craziness out there in mm -hmm. our community. It don't seem like the police is gonna help you guys, Sam. That, 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 I just don't see it. And it's not nothing against that. They, they're not helping nobody in the city of Cleveland right now because right. they just don't have enough police officers. That's right. uh, That's right. I think Polinsic Things said they are down 313 police officers. That's a lot. That's a lot of I, I, Kenny, I, and I don't think we're expecting, the business people aren't expecting that, but they don't want now because of that failure. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you got neighbors saying they are seeing the crime go up. Mm -hmm. The easy target is that corner store, that corner gas station. Oh, yeah. Let oh, yeah. Make, let's make him do it. And the problem is that's going to make matters worse. If he leaves, what do you think is going to come? All you're going to get is an abandoned neighborhood. You're no. going to get no services. Now, can you mm -hmm. speak to this issue? Because, and I have witnessed this. There's, there's two things, that, and I've talked to Kenny about this. I witnessed both of these things. One it, is sometimes I understand why. The stores have to be open 24 hours. I didn't before, mm -hmm. but now I do because of, the, of insurance, and it just yeah. makes sense. But there are certain times of the night that I'm not going to stop, and I don't, I'm not a scary guy, okay. but there's certain times I'm just not going to stop because there's, a, there's always a crowd. I remember one day when I was having a conversation with him about <laughs> this, and I actually seen it for myself. <laughs> I was taking pictures, and again, this is what I'm talking about. There's a gathering. Uh, and they're generally speaking, they're young people. They're speaking, they're African American. They have big trucks or motorcycles, and they just get out and they start having a party, just like right at the gas station. Right, one was just on Fifty Fifth and and uh, Car and Cedar. All right, what is that about? And so, well, can you speak to that? And then I also have noticed. I don't believe this is true for all Arab store owners or small business owners, but I do know there there seems to be a synergy between the drug dealer. And selling drugs at the corner stores and the corner store owner. Nah, that's that that happening. no, that's absolutely one is. I can, I can assure you they probably called numerous times and no one's responded. Do you, are you asking them to take that drug dealer on? What's a drug dealer? Right. And let's say you take the camera photos and show it to the police that they do nothing. What do you expect that owner to do? What's his next step? To, to go confront him and get shot? Do you know how many grocers have been shot in the line of work while they're working? in a robbery or confronting someone to get off their lot. 
Oh, no, I don't. Yeah, and th see, that's something you need to know. How You're getting an employee or an owner who's barely making it, and you've got these guys sitting out there having a party. What do you think is going to happen when this guy that's five foot eight going to go to, to ten guys, you know what I mean, and say, get off my lot? What do you think With all your noise. Yeah. They're probably going to get beat down. Yeah. Now you tell yeah. uh, and now why when he called the police and shows them the video and shows them their license plate won't they do anything? Yeah, I, I, listen, I, I wonder that too. I do. And when that's your only recourse you got, that's only See, recourse. That, that, I mean, that, what do you have? That's that's all now, you, you got. want him to take a gun. If he shoots them, he's sued. He gets shot. It's his life. Right. Uh, how come what you, the scenario you just gave? How come it doesn't happen in Westlake or Avon right. or Lakewood? Why why is it in the city of Cleveland? I'm gonna tell you why. The, re the reason why is because those guys don't live in Westlake and those places. They live in the city of Cleveland, just like Aaron Phillips. So he called me. Oh, kid, they out there now. I'm going to send you the video. They out there now. Now, he said he called me and I'm like, man. So he, he, he sent me the video and I'm looking at it. But I know Cleveland, the store owner didn't get on the phone and say, hey, Party over yeah. here at my gas station. Yeah. These guys just drove up, probably needed gas. Yeah. They, they ain't just come up there neither. I mean, they doing and well, they and when they pulled up, they it's a lot of them, and that's yeah. how they roll. And when they get up, they make noise. Their music is loud. The store owner in there being like, "Man, please get your gas and get up out of here as soon as yeah. you can." And, and it's just what happens in the city of Cleveland. And I think and, and, it's and, just and, what happens. And Kenny, I think that would happen if the gas station was closed. They would still yeah. be there, except. They were probably breaking <laughs> and go looting the place. If, if that's, that's those guys. Yeah. And again, this is why I'm trying to get Phillips to understand. Everybody that pulls up to the gas station with loud music and a couple of their guys with cars isn't up to bad shit. No, they could be just pulling up because we having a good time tonight. My car's looking good. I got my boys. We feeling good tonight. Oh, we need some gas. We come. Oh, it sounds even better in here because it's echoing up off of Sam's big old canopy he got up there. They getting their gas. The girls in there get, they just come with a lot of racket. And from riding by looking over there, you probably, oh no, I'm not going over there. Those right. guys probably get what they want to get and get going. The problem that Sam and them having is those guys, when those guys leave, it's three or four other guys that are still standing there. Standing, yeah. Those guys. And those they, are the problem guys. And they know the law is on their side. No yes. one's going to move them. And nobody's going to move them. And they move challenge them. you to move yeah. them. You see those guys and you like, look at these trucks and no. stuff. Them trucks no, getting no, all no, I, I, I will tell you this. I'll, ch I'll, move them. I'll tell you what. I, how about, I'll tell you what. Let's take a date and, I'll, and you can bring three or four people. And I can tell you where it happens. I want to see how you're going to confront the situation. No, I'm wondering. Yeah, I would like to do that. And okay. I, 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 <laughs> yeah, right. Would, yeah, we gonna do it now. Listen, I just I, 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 hey, y'all, hey, viewers, y'all heard him say yeah, that. I we would, gonna take the camera and we gonna I, let Phillips. He I, said he gonna approach him. Okay. We and gonna listen, let him. I, I want to witness that. You, <laughs> you can <laughs> you can witness that on a daily okay. basis. Okay. Anyway. I used Multiple. to ask always the commander. <laughs> I used to always ask the commander, listen, when you have a car that needs to do a report, please park at the gas station. Yeah, that's Just that's the visibility good. of it. Absolutely. That, that would deter. And then y'all yeah, give them like free coffee at uh, one point. Y'all was doing all that. Just free car washes too. We, we washed all their cars for free. We did all of that. So, that so let's let's go yeah. into it now because we, we over our little time limit here. So let's well, talk about. Another day because well, this is good. Let's talk about some quick solutions while we're here. And let's, let's spend the next. 10 minutes, if we got 10 minutes left, fellas, let's just talk about some solutions, Sam. So in, in, in your, let's talk about the the building and housing portion of, and not just the pick out building and housing, but you said in your line of business, you do a lot of pulling permits and trying to build in the city of Cleveland. Yeah. What do you think can help out, you think the city can do to help the guy, the contractor to be able to get through that process? Any ideas of that? I think they need to streamline where it's a one-stop shop. Not, not, I don't need to go get my permit and go to another room to get a legal description, then go to the record room to see what it was. Then I got to go to planning to see if it's in the design review district. You've got layer after layer. If you go to any other city, it's basically I'm going to one counter, getting my permit, and I'm out. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some cities that give you this choice. It's 30 days and out. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's Once I pr uh, present my permit, they go to a private architectural firm. Okay, we pay the fee. That's fine mm -hmm. for the inspection. If you don't have it in there, there's no reason for that backlog. Whether you give that choice to the business people, so I know within 30 days I'm going to have my permit one way or another. And you said it was a difference in dealing with East Side 
elected official and processes and west side what's there, it? I, there, there is and and what what happens my dealings and i have brought you into some mm -hmm, of these to mm -hmm. see the differences i can talk with a councilman on the west i don't need to have meeting after meeting mm -hmm. over something as, as simple as building an addition or ag bringing a million dollar investment to his place that's really supposed to be legal I, I come to the east side now i need to have i have to meet with this group i have to meet with that group that then has to give me his blessing and then they don't want a liquor license here they don't want it to be they don't want it to be open 24 hours they don't want you to sell chicken it's like pulling <laughs> teeth it's like having and, and and i'm going to tell you something it's usually the same loud voices mm -hmm. it's four or five and the community is not four well, or now, five or six we, people now we should put this on the table because you know what that sounds like to me that's going here so are you saying that it's easier to deal with the white councilman than is the black councilman I, no, what no, he's saying, not what that ain't what he no, said. No, because there's some okay. white councilman on the east side. <laughs> okay, no, that's not what okay, I'm saying. Okay, no, that's yeah. not what I said. Okay. Okay. And there's, that's what yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. but I'm yeah, saying yeah, no, I'm telling you, there's a different, there's that. a different way to do business, and it's I'm not whether it's right or wrong. I can streamline and get things done much quicker with some versus others. Some others, I you were elected to make some choices. If I have to go to the citizens for everything I need, what do I need you there for? You were elected to do something and get things done. Mm -hmm. If I need to have a community meeting after community meeting, maybe I should just elect a community. You don't need to be where you're at, okay, to make you because you can't make a decision. And you're supposed to represent the community. You're supposed to represent the community, and that's why I'm coming to you. And, 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 and like most of the time, and it's not just to pick on the east side or the west side, just in general, just trying to do business. Yeah. And, that, and and when we say doing business is the the way you do business and it affects how the east side looks today. It affects on how the development goes on over there. All of that is a part of that. And all of these little steps and barriers along the way, you can't keep having, like you say, you'll have a meeting and a community is made of 32,000 people. Let's, in, let's in, say 25,000. 25,000 people in a yeah. war and you have a meeting and 10 people show up. That's not a representation of the community at all. It, well, it's not a good representation. You, and, and I believe that the com elected officials ourselves and some elected officials i ain't gonna say all some elected officials hide behind that in order to not make good decisions and as a result of that their community suffers and you or, or they're them, afraid to make this or they're afraid to make decisions well, also i was heavily involved in games with the not uh increasing downsides in city council mm -hmm. are their pay but what you're suggesting kind of implies maybe we don't need to have all no, that. No, no, we no. say that. Well, we did, exactly we know, what that. we're saying is they, need to, make, they need to make a damn decision. They there to make a decision. Make the decision. Yeah, I, I, and I, and I, what I, he I, said is he can go to some councilman on the west side. Because he, he made a point. We said that there's some white councilmen on the east side too. So it's not an east versus yeah. We just said that there's some councilmen on the west side. That it's easier to do business with them in their community to get stuff done. And then if you wonder why the west side looks a little bit different than the east side is because it's easier to get work done sometimes over there. Yeah. There's some council members, and I won't be shy, but Mr. Phillips and Pastor wouldn't be nice if I said some of their names, so I won't. Makes it very difficult to want to do business in exactly. their community. Let me give you, an, let me give you a uh, sample of what happened. No. Right. Listen, I will tell you, before you, because as a defender mm -hmm. of not downsizing city council and decreasing their pay, once you get into this work, I actually said, Mm -hmm. To a councilman, what you said, just the other day, I said, maybe we should. Mm -hmm. And I was a, a starch fighter, make sure we don't do that. I, I said to him, so maybe we don't, if we had to go through all of this, mm -hmm. then why do we need council people? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we I don't need, so, no, we don't no, need I, that council no, person. No, but I'm a, what I'm saying to you, and I remember the person who was leading that fight mm -hmm. uh, to downsize city council had the same arguments that you're using, and, and I understand it now. Did at that yeah, time. but that has nothing to do with the size of council. That has right, right. and, and I well, would say would. less yeah. representation is not going to make. Is not. If, for example, let me give you an. If I'm a small business, I want to build what, whatever I want. There's a process at city hall for me to pull a permit. Okay, let's say I needed a variance. The board of zoning. Right. Uh, it goes through the thing and they dictate who's the impacted people and they send them out. Now, that's usually a lot of politicians take that route. There's a path. This is how it is. There's others that say, let's meet this thing to death. We're going to have 10 meetings. And then I still have to go to the Board of Zoning Appeal, and they mm -hmm. still have to put out all their stuff. And I'm still going through all of these. The difference is a year and a half later. Right. That's all. Right. That's all. 
And I've listened to the same seven people, where, mm -hmm. wherever well, it is, no, it's the same the loud voices that now are become overrepresented because of the, the silent majority is say, right. staying why, silent. Those loud voices and that particular council person is impeding progress mm -hmm. in our communities, which makes our communities look... Man Listen, That's I, correct. I'll say this in close. I know Ken wants to. All you have to do is take a look. Whether you're a small gas station or a big operation like Amazon, take a look. People who want to develop want the easiest path to resistance, and they want the process to be easy. They don't want to come and spend money, and you give them a headache to spend their money. Mm -hmm. All you have to take, and I want you to take a look at this. Look at where all the big major Amazon centers are. They're right on the outskirts of the city of Cleveland. I'm talking about one street away from the border. That's true. There's a reason for that. That is true. Okay? And it's not because of land. There's plenty of vacant That's land in the true. city. We have some, we may have a couple of real small ones, but the big job centers and the really large ones are right outside, across the street. Uh, you Euclid, got Brooklyn, Brooklyn yeah. North Randall, yeah, right. Euclid. So, fellas, because we, we don't I care. leave you with that. Look no, no, because no, we got to get one more. Because you, you gave me a solution on building housing. What we could Let's talk about for the business owners in the inner city. Give us some ideas or some solutions you think, based off of your experience of being a business owner, that you believe the city, if you the city was listening, if Mayor Bid was listening to you right now or some of them, and you say, you know what, I instead of you saying we closing our stores again, why don't you guys do this? Give me some solutions you think that would be good solutions you think that can help. I, th I think what they have to do is include the the smaller business people in some type of some type of uh, whether it's an ad hoc board where they meet regularly to discuss their issues, mm -hmm. instead of coming out with these unfunded mandates and thinking they know best. I, th I you should have a representative of the city that addresses some of their needs and goes out and has regular meetings to say what are some of the issues. Give me some of your ideas. Let's share our ideas. Let's see if we can come to a public private partnership where we can make some of these things better. Whether it's getting through the permits, whether it's maybe we give access to all the cameras and all these stations to the police department so they can actually see mm -hmm. and yeah, do yeah. some follow up. Mm -hmm. uh, great idea. And I, I think it's just how do you bring these people together? Do you, do you think they have some dialogue to? And not, I don't think any of that's existed. Do you think they need to add more cameras? I can tell you almost that I don't think you'll find one square inch of any gas station that doesn't have, have a camera, a camera that, right. that is not covered by a camera but mm -hmm. obviously that's not solving anything because if you give them the tape and you give them the license plate nothing's happening how about me and you mentioned once before we talked about a loan program how do you think that would work you was talking about a loan program that will help re yeah, pay. I, I think an idea to get some of these guys to invest more money to upgrade their facilities is they have a revolving fund Mm -hmm. to, to have them as a group, for example, you throw, let's say, uh, $30 million. That's That 30 stays there. So you loan it to A, B, and C. They pay their interest and stuff. That pot just keeps growing for a smaller business to keep growing because it's very <coughs> difficult to go through a bank and all the red tape to get to, to upgrade your uh, facilities. So that's simply different than a storefront renovation. Well, whether they need to upgrade equipment to get, to get caught up with times and technology mm -hmm. or whether it's for security. Or just to upgrade the facility to meet the neighbor the neighborhood needs and the councilman needs and the city requirements, so, so, landscaping, whatever it is. So in in other words, not just to say we want to put together a small business loan program, we want to you, we're saying specifically put together a small business loan program that's going to go towards helping specific small businesses like, like the corner stores like the business the gas stations and some of those that need it i think it should be open to a lot of all of the small businesses in the city clean because i think they all they all have the same issues that the gas stations are facing whether it's a hair salon or whatever I, mm -hmm. the, the amounts they need may be different but i mm -hmm. think it's more difficult for them to get their hands on the money to upgrade it's their very facility true. Mm -hmm. very true. We, we have many entrepreneurs in our congregations who barbers and hair salon owners who need those same kind of needs that you have. I, I think it's important that there's a relationship built between the store owners and the community, the people long standing in the community like the churches. I would Correct. really like to see those corner store owners and the pastors in those neighborhoods really working together as a community. And I think some just, and what I, what is happening, and I'm not telling you what I think, what happens is the, sometimes a pastor on 131st Street doesn't even know who the store owner is across the street. 
Mm-hmm. Don't even know that owner is. Yep. Y'all know this, what I'm talking about. Yep. And uh, one one time we did a whole protest at this corner store on 131st Street with the pastors over there. And I asked them, okay, has anybody ever, because of the- Isn't the, that the, the pastor's fault? No, let me fit, no, I'm going to tell you. So when I went there with the councilman mm-hmm. of, the, of the ward for the protest, because there was a lot of prostitution, drug, whatever, there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the gas station is literally right across the street from the church. I went because I suppose it's a better part of the- Oh, you, Hold you, on a second, let me finish. You, was it prostitution going on at the gas station? Yeah. there was yeah, Inside the, or outside? No. <laughs> See, they were co- yeah, no, the because you can't is, say all this. We, we're going to get you, brother. Okay, no. I, all right. Listen, I'm credible. Yeah. So my message yeah. is credible. The ga- there's a bus, there's a- so or was the or was the prostitute walking, walking past no, no, the no, gas so station? She, she straight up right in front I'm, of the I'm gas not station. I'm trying to give you the details of that because that's not what I'm talking about. But since you want to know the yes, details, yes, because it's bus, important. There's a bus stop, okay, right in the front there, yeah. and then and that was a hangout for a lot of prostitution and human trafficking and all this stuff. It's so bad they actually closed the gas station closed. But when we when I went to protest that day, yeah, I asked the pastor, has anybody had a conversation with the owner? To have the, and has anybody ever tried to, have you ever tried to, did we ever try to come together to do something about this and before we came out here protesting it? And every pastor, including the council person, said no. I yeah. said, why aren't we, yeah. I'm here with you guys, I'm yeah. with you, I understand we need to clean the neighborhood up, but why don't we start with a conversation yeah. before we start with the closing? And that, that station has since closed. Well, now, that's now, 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 let me ask you this now. Do you think that's fair? You have an RTA bus stop that's causing <laughs> right. the problem. And the gas station guy has to pay the price for that because RTA can't secure their bus. Maybe they need to remove that bus. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Maybe you should move not the bus station. the gas station. And, and here goes my other point. Why would they waste all that energy in saying that we're going to protest and do all of that versus going out there dealing with the problem yeah. with the prostitute who's dealing? Maybe give her some help. Maybe talk to whoever got her out there doing it and, and use the energy for that. I just don't get it, man. Yeah. And, and our community well, has been failing not, time not and time again my, because nobody's point. even doing that, that, that shit. That, I don't my, get it. That is my point that there has, I believe, and those pastors now will agree with me, that we should have a, a relationship with the owner. It's a relation because the owner got nothing to do with yeah. the crime that's going on outside of his business. Hell with him. That's on the that, sidewalk. That's on, that's the on sidewalk. a public sidewalk. Come, it's happening come, and you wanted him to pay the, the price for it. The pastors and the, the people owner, in the community are not and dealing and with and the and issues. You give me a pushback because I think we all should solve the problem together. <laughs> and, we, and let me tell you why. You know why the owner, the owner is involved? Because the gas station is open. 24 hours a day so and that's and because there's since the end since it's open 24 hours a day they're going to be 24 hours a day activity so that becomes and? the issue so that becomes when there's 24 hour day activity in your business that becomes a problem no there no, would be activity on no, that lot if no. he closed or if he didn't like those people no. that hang out would be hanging you out you just said no, it was a bus sure stop you sure. said she was sure. at the bus since, stop since that gas station closed that activity is not happening anymore I don't think I disagree with you. And I think that gas station, if I'm oh, th- yeah. if I'm thinking the right gas station, that gas station didn't close. That, that closed because they had a fire and they're rebuilding. They didn't close because of that. So that's not true. And if you look at their cameras, they have all kinds of problems. And they keep getting broken into as they're closed and trying to repair. Right now, as we speak. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, they come through the roof. Well, I, 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 you don't see the traffic that they have. At, at they the still get broken into. You, you don't, don't see the traffic that they had before. But before, while they were open, it's not the same. You just thing haven't been by there, but the I same people. The they still. I, I I can probably have that owner give you tape and show you how many people hang out there at night while they're closed, if you want to see that. That yeah, didn't. I none of that really it. helped. Maybe you didn't see customers going there. And I'm going to tell you what service what they saying. do. The uh, when you're open 24 hours, there's let's say a lady broke down, or your wife broke down going there. There's a place to go and actually get a little bit of safety, instead of that vacant street, where these thugs are hanging out. I wouldn't. I'm not sure. I wouldn't want to uh, they, they, send my wife to. The, to I, imagine, the imagine if sure. she was there and got stuck there. Would you rather have someone that's open? At least she can stay in the place and call the police or call you to come because they her, know or stay outside in her broken down car on that corner when they know that she's broken down. This is where I'm getting that. Now you, t- uh, uh, now uh, you a tell store, me. I mean, yeah. A store owner knows the people in the community. This is the part that I think that everybody's failing. Everybody failed to believe that they say, oh, because you're not from the community. They know the community. People have been walking in and out yeah. that store for years. So they know who's in the community, who's real and who's not. Yeah. So if my wife 
broke down in in that neighborhood somewhere and she came in there and she needed help they would look at my wife and know she don't belong there she's not out of her element a little bit they will give her some help but it's a difference from some of these yeah. other people who are from the community who comes in there with sometimes bull crap, man. And let's just call it for what it is. And sometimes you have to be able to decipher what's real and what's not real. That's all I'm saying, Philip. Yeah. And, 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 so, and I can assure you that she would be under 24 hour surveillance from those cameras from sound and video. So you would know how safe she is there. Yeah. Now, if, if someone wanted to do something, they'd do it anyway. But it's easier sure. for them to do if she was by herself and there was no one there and there's no cameras. Yeah. Sure. sure. I don't know any business okay. owner I know of, that I know of right now, yeah. that believes that they can make any type of money off of what's going on outside of yeah. their business on right. the streets. Because the street money ain't there. No. And they know that. So if you can't blame if... There was some woman prostituting at a bus stop in front of his business. No more on him than you can blame it on RTA. Yeah. You can't blame the guys who walking up and down the block. And now he sold some drugs in front of your station. But now he decided I want to come in the store and buy me a pop and yeah. some chips and stuff. Yeah. He goes in. He's not selling drugs in the store. <laughs> but you did just see him sell some outside in front of the business. Yeah, what do you do? You Are you EA? Do you come in and be like, hey, you were just you in the element of what you in and you in the inner city of cleveland and you in that element that happens and i think what's going on in our community right now is that it's happened a little bit more than what people would like to see i think that is a show enough element of the fact that the community is not being safe because we're not safe because we don't have enough police officers. So it, it, the presence of safety is not there and who we want to blame to try to bring safety in, mm -hmm. a buck is being passed around everywhere. So I was hoping that with our conversation, just what you say, Phillips, is that we're going to continue to have this conversation to try to open up dialogue so that people can get a better understanding of each other. Some of the myths that they think about air business owners and how much they're making out there and all of that is crazy and some of the past times of how they get educated yeah. all that is, is bull crap in our community and it's stuff that helps divide us i think at some point or another we do need to bring it together somehow yeah. Yeah. but hell black folks we got to bring it together ourselves before we can look to ask anybody else to help us and that's really what's going on so well, that, that that that's our biggest issue as well as our brothers here in the who have yeah. the businesses in our community hey man all we could tell you to do is do the best you can yeah. and hopefully yeah. you do good business and i'm one that they say that there's some bad businesses out yeah. there, but I believe there are bad businesses out there, black, white, every yeah. kind of business. And all I can tell you, if you find a business that's not good in your community, the best thing you can do is stop going there. Correct. And Correct. tell everybody else to stop going there too. Yeah. That business will be closed in no time. Listen, yeah. I said, yeah. I think I'm just one of the good ones. So if there's a bad one, stop going, come to your house. I think that was a good place for us to end the show. I think, uh, Sam, one, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, okay. Came on. We got a lot of things accomplished. We're going to keep this conversation going. We'll be back at you guys probably about another month, and we're going to review what happened in this last election and see what things else is going on in Cleveland as we expand this table. Maybe we'll have a new guest. We'll see you all next week, and make sure you tune in. Peace. Yeah.